Welcome, Miguel Angel. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here at NJIT second year. Oh, second year says hello. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, and uh, we are very excited to listen to what you have to show. So please um, <clears throat> present yourself briefly to the room so they know um, who you are and, and why is that you're here and and then off we go. Okay. Okay. Well, um, good evening from Madrid. Um, you can hear me correctly, right? You can hear me well? Okay. So yeah, um, I'm Miguel Angel Igoa and I'm from the um, I'm Madrid School of Architecture from the Polytechnic University of Madrid. And I'm here to talk to you about handmade processes, basically. And uh, thank you especially to, to Maria for inviting me and having me over uh, virtually at least. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to speak to you today. So we'll just start with the presentation or yeah. Okay, good. So handmade processes, that's basically the title of this talk. Um, you know, us architects, I think we're really, um, well, let's face it, we're not good with names, okay? We, they're either really cheesy or just boring. So I went for the basic and boring title, handmade processes. Now, why, why talk about handmade processes when we live in this sort of era of, you know, high tech and all these computer software that helps us uh, design and make our arch architecture? Why? Well, personally, I think that handmade processes are still and handmade, you know, creative processes are still very useful personally because our job as architects, okay, uh, is a very complex one, right? We have to deal with a lot of complex issues, with a lot of complexity, with a lot of, um, you know, problems at the same time from many different fields. So I think personally, I find it useful to, to handle all of this complexity with very simple means, with very simple tools and very basic tools to control that complexity. That's what I um, think. And that's what I try to show you in this presentation. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean, of course, that I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to be all about, you know, handmade models and drawings and stuff. It's going to be also about the mixture between the digital and the analog, sort of say, or or the between the computer and the hand, because I think I believe that the mixture of these two um, is really the well my way of working and a lot of uh, people's way of working now, which is the combination and the, and the balance, the correct balance between the two. And also because, um, you know, as long as we, we, we realize that the computer is like another tool. Okay. It's just like the pencil, just like the paper. Uh, it's just another tool. Okay. So we'll start off from there, uh, with that basic concept. Now I started, um, I mean, may, as I'm sure many of you have, um, you know, in, in the past or when you're growing up, you, you like drawing or you like sketching or you like just, just like me, um, making stuff with your hands, right? Just making, you know, models or drawings. And, um, when I entered architecture school, I thought, you know, they were going to teach me all this big high tech, you know, CAD drawings and, you know, computer modeling. And in a way they did, but not like I expected. I'm sure it was the same for you in a way. And, uh, I, in my first year design, design, um, studio subject. I was in a I was in a class with a with a professor called Ulargi, and um, he taught us this very basic drawing and handmade process techniques, which will not which would not only involve hand drawing obviously, but also uh, hand modeling. So making models out of hands and using the models to, you know, to design our architecture. Now. Uh, the way we started our first year um, architecture school, uh, well, design studio exercise was never with a brief about a building. It was never, you know, okay, start, um, you're going to design an apartment complex with this many apartments and no, it was only, it was always in a sort of playful manner. So first exercise was forget about the building, forget about architecture, just take a small container, okay, like a small shoe box and try to fit in those in that little box as many pieces as you can to assemble the biggest piece. So we don't so we forget about architecture for a moment and we say, okay, we deal with even more basic concepts in architecture, which I think are very useful, especially to start with, which is um, you know, assembly have to have to do with building and have to do with making a, a solid, a good solid structure, has to do with volume, with size. 
So this was my uh, first exercise, which was just a very simple cardboard pieces that would then be a set that would fit in this very small box. But when assembled, you would get this very large object. Now, um, of course, you know, uh, part of our job as architects is to be like a, a bit like performers. Okay, so now you can see me in that little um, dome. So you can see that the scale. Now, this, of course, would develop into a building. But for now, we focused on making something with our hands that would be a solid construction. And that, well, as you can see, it's, uh, well, you know, as, as an exercise, a starting point was very interesting, even more than just, okay, start designing, a, you know, a, a house or whatever. Okay. So uh, he then told us, okay, more basic concepts in architecture, concepts of life, for example. We kept developing and developing these models with hand. We kept uh, making more models and to develop something like, um, okay, take into account the light. The light is very, as a very important, as you know, in architecture, obviously. Um, but, you know, through many iterations, through many different handmade models with, and many different materials also, you would get an object like this. Now, this, for example, um, by the way, I'm going to show you um, some, this is the first thing I made in an architecture school, which is not, you know, the most beautiful thing, I admit, but, you know, I'll, I'll show you many different projects later and of many different students. And uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, he then told us, okay, this is going to be, try to think of this now as um, a building, let's say a gathering space. So I decided to make from the first model, kept developing it, and made this sort of nest. Now, the good thing of working by hand is that the hand never works the same twice. So when you make something like this by hand, you get all these iterations, right? It's never, you know, it's never sim completely or perfectly symmetrical. You always get that sort of um, handmade quality to it, right? Um, which sounds redundant, right? But uh, that's what I made. So uh, we always think of, let's say, we make a drawing, like we, we make all those plans in section and everything, and then we make a model. But this is the other way around. We make a model and then we make the plans out of the model. Now, how? Well, you basically would, in this case, they just told me, just take a picture from the top of the of the model and just trace that. And that's what I, what we did. It was always, a, um, a, it's always about mixing the tools, mixing the hand modeling and using the models also as a design tool itself to keep developing the rest of the in this case, the drawings and stuff, right? Now, another thing that they taught us how to how to do in this in this uh, design studio was how to draw just with a pencil on very uh, on a very particular kind of tracing paper, and without a ruler. There are no rulers used for these all of these um, crazy looking lines. No ruler. So that would give, so why why is that? Why would you you know make life harder for yourself? Well, because it gives you uh, it you de start developing the hand. The hand is like a muscle. So it needs to sort of go, you know, it needs exercise. So when drawing without a ruler, it gives you that kind of, uh, you know, tool to later on, you know, well, you, you start you start drawing better and better, right? So uh, in this case, this would be like a section through the building or, or a side view of the model, which would then uh, become the the section, just tracing. So different, uh, using the different documents to, um to, to keep developing the project, right? Now, um, different kind of, uh, well, views, everything is done, just a layer on top of a layer using the tracing paper, and you start developing all these different layers. Now, for example, for the next exercise, this was in the, yeah, the, the next project, we were thinking of, okay, we were not gonna, we're not gonna start with a, an architecture brief, the classic architecture brief. They just told us, in this case, build something, build like a plinth or a pedestal, for a bottle of wine. Now, why a bottle of wine? Because a bottle of wine is something that is both extremely heavy or very heavy and fragile. So you needed a very sturdy construction. Now, what this has in common with the previous um, model I showed you is that I like this idea of making something that looks fragile or looks very sort of crazy, but it's actually very sturdy construction. I think that's very interesting as a concept. Um, so in this case, I just took a whole bunch of uh, cardboard triangles which were actually um, three, um, three different uh, triangles, and then uh, it just assembled them in this way, and you would get a very sturdy structure. So it kind of looks very flimsy, but this is not Photoshop or anything. This is the real thing. Bottle did not break. Okay. So then later on, we would, you know, just okay. You have to develop this into a working plan. So you would draw it. 
you would cut a, a horizontal section to get a floor plan and you would keep developing that until you got well, something like this, which would then later be like a, a housing project. So all these little cell like uh, circles, those would be like the houses. And uh, I'm just going to um, skip through this quickly because I want to get to a better example, which was um, a student sitting, um, well, my classmates sitting next to me, um, he developed this project. Now, you might think, oh, you know, he, they use only the most basic tools, right? Pencil, uh, paper, it's all going to be the same. Couldn't be further from the truth. Each and every project was completely different. Now, not to not to bash like the computer. Believe me, I love, okay, I wouldn't say I love computers, but um, they are useful, of course. But um, let's face it, at least in my school, let's say, 70% of the of the projects in our in the same class look alike. They're all very similar. And uh, this did not happen when making it by hand. By when we all we all we were all sharing the same method and the same tool, which was just pencil on the same tracing paper, the same way of drawing. And yet each and every project, we were maybe like, I don't know, 70 or 80 students in the class. They were all completely different projects. And this was the guy sitting next to me, actually. And he developed, for example, this um, project. Now, keep in mind that these were um, maybe a meter and a half long, the sheet of paper. This was a huge piece of paper. By the way, all measurements I'm going to say in this talk is going to be in meters, okay? Because that's what um, God intended us to use, okay? Because I, I know you use all the imperial system and all that. But <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, don't, I cannot use that. So I just... Use meters, okay? So a meter and a half. I don't know what's that like. Um, five feet. Five, okay, five, five feet. feet. Okay. <laughs> okay, five feet. So yeah, very big piece of paper, or maybe even more. Almost, almost, almost. Yeah, almost uh, six feet. So um, and uh, whenever you draw by hand, I'll show you more details of this project. This was my. This is not my project. This is my uh, the the guy sitting next to me. So you can see the difference between um, the projects, and that it would be. Uh, extremely different in spite of uh, using the same tool, which is just pencil and paper. Um, you can draw, okay, um, something like textures. You can keep developing textures. You might think, you know, with a pencil, you can do everything. You can everything. I'm, I'm, I know I'm kind of talking like I'm, I don't know, like a dinosaur. And, and like, yeah, paint, a pencil is like high tech stuff. No, not really. But it's, you, you can, you know, it's a very freeing uh, tool when it's just a simple tool. In a way, I think, I think I find it very freeing. So some more pictures of this um, project by my uh, classmate. Basically, it would be like, you know, to have some common areas and smaller buildings and larger buildings that would house, you know, uh, different apartments and stuff. Now you can see the different uh, textures. And also, since you're drawing it by hand, it's a lot, it's also freeing. It's also, uh, it's a very freeing activity to draw by hand and not be, because, you know, CAD, for example, you want to use AutoCAD, you see the... Um, the little um, thing on the screen that is a cross. It's like it wants you to draw orthogonal lines and, and everything very square and straight. But when drawing by hand, you're a lot freer in a way. Now, of course, these drawings would take a very, very long time to make, yes. But that kind of gives you, you know, time to think and to sort of process and meditate about what you're drawing. Because since you have to draw each and every line, you then are in control of your own. You, you have to, you know what you draw. And, but instead of in your computer, you just, you know, you, you copy paste and that's it, which of course is also useful in a way, right? Now, um, well, for example, you can see below the model that he made mixed with the drawing. When I was making this presentation, I kind of, it kind of, this image reminded me a bit of the famous paintings by Zaha Hadid, which I just wanted to mention here briefly because, she, you know, we know about her architecture being this very, very complex parametric architecture stuff, but actually she started honing in this uh, complexity with her hand paintings, right? We've we, we all seen her paintings. They were these huge, big paintings, right? And, you know, you, you, she, would be able, she would be able, sorry, to achieve this complexity just with paint, right? I just wanted to mention her. Now, um, now this, uh, this actually, this was a few years ago, right? But uh, right before Christmas, I had my first semester as a... Um, as a teacher or as an assistant teacher in my, uh, with the same teacher who taught me this uh, method. So it was kind of interesting to, to see the other side of it and how would we uh, develop the project with the students. So um, we, in this, in this uh, semester, 
now as me as a teacher sort of um we told them okay we're gonna start not with thinking about buildings or anything we're gonna start with basic stuff so you're all gonna take a sheet of paper standard 20 by 30 centimeters um sheet of paper and you have to make it stand you just have to make it stand how well um you just have to deal with it so you can take it and fold it or you know tear it apart uh, cut it out fold it again or whatever right so you know as you can see the first few models were very simple the you know you, you may not see much potential from it but from this we actually developed the project that would span well it spanned from september to december just uh yeah so just last year is right before christmas so um so from these few models that the first day we made these models very simple paper models folded for example a student developed this next model now uh we told them okay now take your paper model and uh, develop it in a, in a new material make it grow and when you do that it's not about making the same thing twice it's about making iterations and that's a good thing i repeat by working by hand right that you can have iterations because the hand never works the same twice so here of course there this model it was actually like a kind of maybe a meter so which was like be like i don't know three feet maybe um so it was kind of a big model right so you could start seeing in spite of its many errors right you could start seeing how this could potentially become a building right the structure at least the structure for a building because also our idea for this uh project was to develop the concept of layering layering very important not only layering when we draw because we you know we work on tracing paper but layering in the let's say the parts of a project so you would see the first layer a structure we would then add another layer later on which would be like the housing units and everything but first a structure now from model to drawing so it's very important uh, to always keep keep going between the two and keep developing it you wouldn't you know this student wouldn't just copy the model as is she would copy she would draw the model but in a very rigorous way in a very architectural way and very technical way so so here when she drew it when she drew it by hand in spite of using a, a ruler of course we would be able to measure but never to make straight lines it will have to be with uh, you know just praying to god that you know everything would come out straight and um to develop this uh structure that we then told them okay for the next exercise we're going to start uh, making the housing units that will occupy the structure now not with um not uh not everything at the same time but just one one house or one housing unit so zoom into this structure of that you created this geometry and start exploring and twisting this jump just playing with it playing around with the geometry right and start to develop a floor plan a floor plan for your house so she would then develop this um this house which as you can see is sort of related to the existing geometry but it became its own thing right now how to occupy a very large space because we then told them okay now you have to take this one single unit and multiply it by let's say 50 or 60 units so she then created this huge sheet uh, which was actually this is very interesting because it looks really bizarre and complex but it's actually uh one or two different units that she um that she multiplied and made look as if it were actually uh all different kind of like kind of like what the what the arabs did like using the their their own geometry this actually uh it seems like a very contemporary idea but it's actually you know centuries old like the arabs used to do this for their decoration which is just take one single angle and the different ways of twisting it would develop a different geometry for their architecture right i'm sure you've seen this now a section through that same unit you know you so, so you start to develop it from floor from the model to the floor plan to the section to the big plan to now this is very interesting because also when you work by hand you are obliged to choose a scale the scale is very important so for example this is in a 1 100 scale this is in a 1 50th scale i believe and when you draw in different scales you you're obliged to tell it in different ways because for example when you draw i'm sure you with this whole has happened to us when we draw by computer let's say we're in autocad or rhinoceros or whatever and we start drawing this little you know a little corner of the building with all the little details and then when we go to print it we just see a black dot because again we're just we never we never work in a in the in the space of the paper 
I would say, okay? So this is, uh, this is a very important notion, this notion of scale, they were drawing different scales. Now, she would then take this um, section and occupy it in the, in the structure. So, so we would have this previous drawing, right, of the structure, and then the next layer, always working in layers. You would have, you can see now it's like full of, you know, uh, full of stuff, right, the next layer. And then back to the model, always switching between the 2D drawings and then the 3D models, like the physical models, right? And then also experimentation with materials. Very important to not just make models out of the traditional model, you know, model materials, like, for example, paper or cardboard or foam. No, she would, why not use metal, right? Or aluminum or whatever. Or for the next layer, she used this sort of beautifully iridescent sort of plastic that, uh, you know, you would be able to play with the light and everything because the next layer was the covering, sort of the facade of the building. As you can see, she chose this um, this method, of, which, which sort of reminded me of this Le Corbusier um, church in France, which I'm sure you've seen. And then back to the drawing, back to the drawing paper. And this would be like the final layer of her of her uh, project. Now, the, the 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 girl sitting next to her, completely different project. This is a completely different project of the girl Marta who was sitting next to her, and she started off with this very bizarre looking model, which kind of looks like a sculpture. But what makes this a what makes this actually a piece of architecture and not a sculpture? The little people. Once we put in the little people, as you can see there in different parts of the of the model it becomes a piece of architecture. It's a very interesting um, exercise because you can maybe, you know, make the people a couple of centimeters tall or 20 centimeters tall. It would change completely, right? So, of course, um, when doing when doing this kind of exercise, um, we start off in a very chaotic, crazy way, right? Which, you know, it's always, it sort of represents our brain, right? Okay, I have to design a building. I have no idea. So I'll just start with the very chaotic, crazy stuff, and I'll just start, you know, slowly develop it. You eventually develop it in a way. So when she drew this, this chaos started to make sense in a way. And even, you know, so much sense that she actually uh, took into account how the building would would put itself on the ground, would, would ground itself, as you can see, with those stilts. And, you know, the crazy geometries would start making more sense. You would get uh, like a hierarchy of different lines, different geometries. And all of this, you can you can really, um, it's really useful to do it by hand. Because apart from this, I'm not showing this to you, but uh, it's basically, you would have a whole huge stack of paper, tracing paper to keep developing it, ideas, just sketching, keep sketching on top, and different ways of resolving this geometries, right? Now, for example, in her case, the facade, she went for this in the model. She would just add another layer to the model and started experimenting because it's also very good to experiment uh, with these kind of models when you have like a, this, especially the big, big models. Um, it's good to use them also as a tool, not as such, sort of something that you want to, you know, to display in a museum very carefully made. Of course, it has to be carefully made, but, um, you know, also use it as a tool. Okay, don't worry. Don't worry if it's not you know, beautifully and pristine the whole time. You can just use it as a as a kind of laboratory. So you started developing this in the model, this sort of woven architecture facade that when she drew it, as you can see, the difference between this and this is that when you draw it, you can sort of um, make it a bit more rigorously, sort of. And uh, in her case, the unit, the house unit, would start off with a very chaotic model, very conceptual model. Um, which was this one here made of wire and like uh, wool. And then when she drew it again, she would start to perfect it. Start perfecting it, then with this, we would sort of make a collage of, of like 50 different copies of the same house and she would develop a whole floor plan. This floor plan that would then, this was the, the, the floor plan and then in section, you have this kind of section. And then, which is very interesting in this, um, in this semester that we told them, okay, the last couple of weeks, you can you're free to develop this project in your own way so what would you like to experiment with these you know with the stuff that you've made so she decided to go to another discipline of design which is fashion and she made this sort of um dress like top that she uh you know it, it was just an experimentation in another discipline because i think it's very interesting that we don't just talk about architecture you know architects just up until recently 
we've always done everything, right? Uh, from architecture to painting to sculpting, you know, like the Renaissance of architect. We would design everything and including the, you know, pieces of like armor or in this case clothing, right? So this, for example, um, it, we sort of, it, we were reminded of um, Buch Studio, which is a, a fashion studio here in Madrid, which is actually made of uh, two founders, which were architects. They were not fashion designers, they were architects. And they would also always, you know, they always experiment with different materials and a mixture between handmade stuff and digital stuff. Like, for example, this, uh, which... Uh, you know, very bizarre piece of fashion. This was developed by hand and digitally. So the mixture between the two, which I think is very interesting. Some pictures of, uh, some images of the, of our class. I mean, our class was just chaotic. It would just, it would just be like a, a whole buffet of just materials. You would never see cardboard actually here. You will always see very bizarre materials that we don't usually use, but plastic that would be melted or you know, clay stuff mixed with uh, wood and metal aluminum, a very high level of experimentation it was very, um, and then this was our final, um, our final, um, yeah, jury, the last day, which would see, I mean, the, all the drawings there displayed and all the models. So that was, uh, that was quite fun. I mean, you can see here, each and every project was different. Each and every project was different. There were no two projects the same, which I'm sure you've noticed that, you know, when, when we do it by by computer, sort of in our case, at least in our my school, at least half of the project looked the same, which is not the case when you do it by hand. But anyway, now I would like to start. Okay, this was sort of the way we were taught in our first year, and then people, you know, I'm sure that this has happened to you that okay, second year, third year, I'll just do my own thing. Why would I keep working by hand? Why would I keep working by hand if I can have a computer? But I said. In my, this was in my fourth year. I'm going to show you now a project I did in my fourth year. That I said, no, I'll just continue working by hand. You know, uh, I would. I, I obviously know how to how to uh, use a computer, but um, I said no. I'll just com because I think there's a lot of value in this handmade process. So this was a project. I'm sure you've maybe you've seen this building. This is a building by Francisco Javier Sanz Oiza. Oiza is a very famous uh, architect from the last century here in Madrid. And he would he made this tower that you can see here on the on the picture on the left, and it was sort of we would we were asked to develop this a second tower next to this tower. So I started just working in models first in models, different iterations of the model. So I made a model very similar to the original tower, and then you can see here the sequence between the you know sort of like the evolution of the idea how I would turn this tower sort of inside out also. We, I would arrive at this conclusion based on the materials I used. You know, just base, just changing the materials of the model, you would get a whole different kind of architecture, right? And then again, drawing this by hand, drawing the the tower on a, on an elevation. Uh, oh, this was of of course already using a ruler because you know I was no longer with that teacher, so I could was able to use a ruler or a T square. I, this was actually made with a T square, which I don't know if. Um, well, I've, maybe you've seen it in, I don't know, museums or something. But anyway, um, and then how would this tower look when you cut a section through it? This is actually very, this is actually very fun and very quick to do with a T-square. Because with a T-square, you just, you know, you just have a straight table, right? And you just start dragging it around. And it's actually very, very quick to use a T-square and the, the other rulers, of course. And um, yeah, this was next to the this was next to the original tower, so you can sort of see the relationship between the two, and, um, and also developing the floor plan. So again, with layering, you just layer one paper on top of the other. The good thing about this is that you can always trace back. You can always look back, which is something that is more difficult to do with a computer. But anyway, um, so you can see here that the relationship between the two floor plans of the original tower and the uh, the new tower that I that I made. It's sort of like turned inside out. Now, this I think it's very interesting to also um, do very seemingly chaotic stuff, but it's actually geometrically very um, rigorous. So, in this way, it was just two different apartments, which you can see here, one on the on the higher uh, left hand corner, left hand corner, and on the right hand corner, uh, two apartments. And when combined, you would develop this floor plan, which looked completely crazy and bizarre, but it actually very um you know well thought out it's not just some artistic thing 
Okay. Now, of course, this tower, how will it touch the ground? Well, something like this, something like looking at nature, like the roots of a tree. This is how the, the tower would touch the ground. And of course, um, you know, in an urban scale. So again, the idea of scale, of course, you don't draw the same. You wouldn't, on, on a real piece of paper, you don't draw the same, something that is in a 1, 1,000 scale or something that is in a 1, 100 scale, right? Completely different. So, um, Okay, another idea, uh, apart from the from the hand drawings and sketches, paper, and handmade models, also a very useful idea of collage. Now, collage, um, in a in a literal way, but also in a conceptual way. So now I'm going to show you a project that I developed completely or almost completely by in in the computer, but still thinking in this sort of handmade way. So in this case, a collage. Now um, we were asked to develop. Um, to design a building that would be like a, a mixed use auditorium building in San Sebastian, which is in the north of Spain, very beautiful place right by the sea. And um, I took the, the basic brief that we were given and I made a collage with that. Now, I think the collage is very useful because uh, in this case, I took the, I know it's in Spanish, but uh, it's basically all the uses of the building. So an auditorium or a theater or a, like a main square or a public square space mixed all together and when in doubt make a collage with like a sort of like a frankenstein you know take the section of this building the section of another different building that you like combine them together it's a very quick way to like maybe in an hour to make a huge sort of architecture um, section because let's face it everything has been done before everything has been done before especially in the you know sort of artistic world everything has been done before and it's so why not use it? You know, why not use it as a as a toolbox, right? So here in this section, you would see this is was made by computer, but you can still uh, see it's sort of it's using the computer as if you were using it by hand in a way. This was just I mean, it's, this is just Photoshop. It's very basic, right? Um, so you can see here the maybe you recognize some of the sections like the Herzog and the Neuron uh, Philharmonic or some cathedral church sections that went or a Greek theater here up up in the in the right hand corner um combination between all those would develop uh the basic concept for the building that when i drew it then i i would switch from the computer to hand again so when you you sort of take these shapes and you you take sort of the abstraction of these shapes and you start making it your own so i'm making it your own literally with a paper on top and um I don't know if this is sounding like I'm talking about like this high tech stuff, but it's actually very simple, right? I mean, it's obviously quite, um, you know, very basic, right? But it's, it's, that's, I think the beauty of it, that you use some very basic tools um, to make this, you know, sort of architecture in the 21st century, right? So then this, uh, I actually made a, a, a Rhino model from these hand drawings, switched to computer, made a Rhino model, 3D model, very complex, took me a long time to make and these were the computer drawings these are actually computer drawings from the uh, 3d model that you can see here this is all computer but from a previous uh very um heavily drawn exercise okay so you see here the the completeness of the of the building um and then i said okay the we i don't know if you have a similar subject in your school but basically in our fifth year we have a subject called um the construction project sort of and we were you would basically have to take a project that you developed in design studio and developing develop it in a constructive way and like you know so, so you so you actually know how to build this crazy stuff um so i said okay this computer this basically this project that i made all my computer i'll develop it i'll develop the the building the building work the building project uh, by hand why because as you can see here, each and every corner of this building is different. So, you know, it's very useful in computer to, if you have a, a building that's maybe, I don't know, 60 floors, 60 stories high, and all, all the stories are the same, you just do one and then just copy paste it 60 times. Very useful to do it that by computer. But in a project where everything is different, um, I think it would be, very, for me at least, it's very, well, it's easier to develop it each of those corners by hand. So I would start making these um, hand drawings. Um, that, as you can see, 
uh, the difference between the, the this drawing and this one is that it's in a much bigger scale. So you have to, when you draw on a bigger scale, let's say this was, I think, uh, one one fiftieth scale, you have to take into account how it's built. You have to start taking into account and start drawing construction details and stuff that you didn't think of before. But when when thinking of the construction of the building, you're obliged to to resolve those issues, right? So I would also sometimes just take these drawings and in Photoshop just multiply it and uh, keep developing. You know, I just develop it through through Photoshop again, mixing different tools, computer, you know, analog, digital. And also, yes, um, this, for example, was a, a section. As you can see, not I'm not I'm I've never been obsessed with sort of making these very clean, clean cut, pristine drawings. So that's kind of boring. I mean, if you do that for the for the last, you know, for the final jury, that's okay. But for the process, this was in the middle of the semester, you know, for the process, I think it's good to see even the sort of you know the dirt accumulated on the on the drawing. You can sort of it, it shows that you've worked on it, right? And why not mix it with the the computer model, you know, uh, you could you could see that you know what you're concerned with is okay uh, structural issues, construction issues. You know, you you start mixing between the two, and you can see the process. This is like when going when you go to the theater, or to you know or look like a puppet show, you can obviously see the strings. You can see how that's done. You can you can see how it's made of, but it doesn't bother you. It, there's there's art in that. You know, there's art in in the in how the puppet is manipulated. You can, there's art in seeing the the behind the scenes of a of a movie. You know, so in in architecture, the same. If you show the process, it's, I think it's much more interesting. So also for okay, and also very important to have a notebook and just doodle on your notebook, right? So you have this little notebook, and and you just you know, I'm sure you all have your your notebooks there, and you would you know be constantly thinking and doodling your project, right? So for example. This was obviously freehand, completely freehand. And then how would this become a more rigorous drawing that would later explain the whole building technique of this particular project? This was, for example, the, the other, the, you know, the new iteration of this um, building technique that would then develop. This was sort of like the DNA of the project, of the building technique that would then result in resolving the whole building. So, for example, again, switch between different scales. This is was in a 1 100 scale. In a 1 100 scale, you don't, uh, you don't care about the, I mean, it's not that you don't care, but it's not about the building techniques. It's about the completeness of the project, right? So this allows you, you know, to use different scales, allows you to think of different concepts of your project, right? And also drawing this and the resulting section of this, these two drawings may be done in a couple of hours because I use a T-square. T-square, it's actually a very, um, it's a very fun tool to, to use. And it's, uh, yeah, you can work very quickly with this. And then jumping through scales. This was in, a, I believe, one... Ah, 150th scale, you can see there in the bottle right hand corner. Uh, it's a 150th scale. So you have to think of how it's built. Now, instead of, you, I've always been a, a fan of doing maybe just one good section with a whole bunch of information instead of doing, let's say, seven different sections, right? With lesser information. I, I you know, maybe it's more chaotic, but I personally like um to to do all these sort of many layers in the same drawing and then this of course is also um you use each drawing to make the next drawing so for example the previous axonometric drawing was developed from this previous section so you know you just layer you just put you know different layers of, of paper and you start developing it um and you can see you can see the process you can always look back this is a good thing of the, and here, yes, it takes a very, very long time to do, let's say, for example, this was a 175th scale floor plan of the whole building, which occupied my whole table, which is like almost as big as me. So, um, in, but, you know, you would draw the texture. You, when you draw texture, you sort of realize, okay, I'm drawing, let's say, uh, you know, a, a wooden floor, for example, or the stones for the foundation and you really you really get to think and realize what you're drawing what you're actually building okay 
it's not for the sake of making like a nice drawing, an artistic drawing. It's to actually understand your own project. You know, you become the expert in your own project. Um, and then, for example, okay, and some more details of the same project done in a one twenty fifth scale, and finally, in a one tenth of a scale, which was this drawing here. So you, you, I mean, the next step from this would be to actually make it in a one, you know, in a one to one scale, which will I, I will talk to you now. The use of the one one, you know, the 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 real life scale, one to one scale. So uh, also, but just before finishing this, you know, why not use drawing also as an experiment or as a tool to you know just experiment graphically. You know, you, you would never you would never see this kind of drawing in a building site because well then i sort of realized why not but because it's sort of chaotic right but again different drawing representation and different ways of building of drawing your own project tells a different concept with each document right so uh, also i want to mention just as i mentioned zahadid uh previously uh early on i want to mention enric miralles which is a, a catalan architect from Spain, and Rick Miray is a very important architecture in uh, in the way that he sort of developed his own um, his own style of working, which was also a lot of handmade stuff, a lot of collage. This was maybe like in the nineties or, or, or early two thousands, um, so you know the computers were around already. But he would still keep keep making this handmade process. So he would he would make this huge collage, a combination between collage and actual architecture drawings or more freehand drawings for his uh, concept and um, this was for example for a design in uh, in Barcelona for, um, for a park or a public park that Enrique Miralles built and as you can see here this handmade process and the, the way of thinking of collage actually translates and ends up in the final built result so you can see here uh, the different floor the different types of flooring the different structures it's it's actual it's an actual collage it's a real life collage, right? So I think it's very interesting. Another um, design for a park by Enrique Miralles, which I actually used um, again as a collage. I just took this and made a collage of a whole sort of urban plan. Why not for the for the Madrid city center, which was another project that we that we made. Again, why not use stuff that has been done before? You know, it has been done for a reason. You should just take that and make collage with it. You know? Another example of a collage by Enrique Miralles, and um, okay, he would do this sort of panoramic views of buildings, so a mixture between like a like photography and like actual real architecture photography and collage, which I I sort of tried using for another project. So for example, this was uh, I took these pictures and just made them into a collage, and then this was actually for a, for a another project for school, but for another subject. So I said, okay, point this out. I'll try to. We were, we were asked to make um, a sort of like a like a, a piece for the street, like a like a like a piece of architecture for the street. Like it could be like a bench or like a shed for the middle of the street. So I said, okay, I'll just take pictures of this. I just take pictures of the street and start sort of collaging them together, making three D models. Actually, it would you know to sort of look like a like a theatrical sort of scenic piece, right? for the middle of the street and then then later on developed it this this was developed by hand developed by computer and then uh well this was like the the end result which was like a like a bench like a shed like for shading but all uh, sort of you know from the pictures of the the street pictures that i showed you and then what i always like and i think uh, living in living in madrid which is a very you know beautiful city it's very useful to i mean i love urban sketching and now you live very near, near new york which is a very you know interesting city in itself right so i would really encourage you to to actually just go outside and just sketch urban sketch you know so i i love making these sort of urban sketches and uh for example, these are different parts of madrid and i think also this is another thing but i think it's very important not to not just do your architecture in let's say school or what your you know what the, what the university asks of you but also make your own thing in your own time so for example in my case it's urban sketching maybe in your case it's i don't know furniture building or um architecture photography but develop your own thing you know you, you, you 
you know, your different interests, your personal interests. Now, for example, for me, as I said, it's urban sketching and um, also combining hand sketches with the digital tools. So what I would do, for example, with this kind of sketch, tear it apart and combining combining it in Photoshop with other with other sketches, print them back and um, like literally print them on paper and start playing with them, you know, start cutting them out and making another collage. So again, the idea of collage conceptually and literally um, to develop, for example, um, these um, sort of pieces that, that would later be like a little a combination of like sculpture and painting. So um, is like the end result. And I think it's very interesting to also develop and also look at, for example, other disciplines. This was from the uh, Broadway uh, Broadway musical of Spider-Man. That's uh, yeah, from yeah, from New York from years ago by director Julie Taymor. So you can see sort of the, like the inspiration. Uh, you know, you, you sort of you sort of you see an image and it's like in the back of your head always. So you you or, for example, uh, I, I've obviously in your subconscious, you have a lot of images and it will show in the architecture that you make. So this, for example, this is not by me. I wish this is a sculpture by Isidro Blasco, which so you can see sort of the relationship between what I made. It's obviously not exact, you know, it's not plagiarism. It's about making your own thing. You have an, you have an idea, someone inspires you, and you sort of decide to make your own thing in with your own tools, with your own interests, right? So, okay, and for, uh, why not? And then another example of like a combination of uh, drawing and the, and the you know, digital tools and different interests. Now I would, okay, another interest. Uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, in architecture we work also in the real world. Now, of course, being students, maybe we can't really, you know, uh, make entire building or can we, which I will show you uh, for the last project. Um, we're sort of finishing already. Okay. I don't know how we're doing it with time, but we're, uh, we're finishing. Okay. So bear with me. I want to show you that. Um, uh, okay. Another interesting thing, furniture. Furniture, but handmade furniture. So actually not just designing furniture, because the good thing about furniture is that you can actually make it yourself, the real thing. So this is a stool that I made. So I'll show you now a quick, uh, see if I can play the clip. Yeah, okay. Basically, um, I developed this maybe in a, in a weekend. Why? Because it's very easy to design furniture. If you just have the proper, let's say, mechanical saw and some wood, Make your own furniture. Why? Because it's like a it's like a small building. In the end, you know, making your own furniture is sort of like architecture, but in a, a smaller scale. And you take into account stuff like okay, it has to be obviously a sturdy construction. Everything that you have to that you have to take into account when designing a building, you have to think about in furniture. Okay, so I think it's very interesting to also develop another interest, which is. Uh, well, these are the different sort of uh, furniture pieces that I that I made. Again, it might seem like a lot, maybe not, but it's actually very easy, you know, to actually develop your own, in this case, furniture and train, translate that into architecture and also to get sort of, you know, not be afraid to get your hands dirty, you know? You know, you have to sand all the pieces and everything and your hands, you know, start to ache and everything, but it's uh, it's worth it because you, you have, you suddenly have something that's not just on a paper. You know, it's not just on a paper or a little fancy rendering or something. It's actually there in the real world. You know? So, um, okay, for the last, yeah, well, the last thing I want to show you is actually, as I said before, may, I said, well, maybe you can actually do an entire building on your own on a one-to-one -one scale. Can you? Um, a couple of years ago in my school, uh, we had the opportunity to if we wanted to show our maybe like ideas, like uh, ideas for either a, a business idea, like a small business thing, or like a, like a workshop idea, just different ideas that we would like to develop. So I had this idea of of uh, why not, you know, making like a small group of students that we would actually make buildings out of recycled materials um, in a one-to-one -one scale. It was very important to always think that it was, this would, we would go straight to the real world and straight to the one-to-one -one scale. So um, I said, okay, but what are we going to make? So I thought, okay, okay, you know how, how like in places like Africa or all over the world, actually, they would use trees as a gathering space. So I said, okay, we'll do like a gathering space in the shape of a tree. 
So again, we started off with just very, very um, simple doodles, like just a very basic sketch, and then just straight to making a very simple model, and then from there straight to doing it in the real, like in the real scale, like on a real the one to one scale. So, um, as you can see, just as just a, a stick like a structure, like a triangulated structure um, made of three different legs and like a, a double sort of roof structure. And um, this was also, this was already in the, um, in the one-to-one -one scale. This is one of the legs that we, that we made. This is, this is, I don't know, like maybe two meters, or like six feet. Um, and uh, we sort of develop, we kept developing it. Now, when you when you sort of do this kind of structure, this triangulated structure, you understand this a lot better. You, we all know, or we all had to calculate the structure and actually theoretically, like you know, do all the numbers and stuff. Which personally, I I'm, I'm not good at that. I mean, I have to admit, I uh, I'm not good at that at all. But I but I sort of you know, how do I do it? Well, it's good to learn it. Uh, you know, doing it you you uh, doing it actually with real material so you get to understand it in a more intuitive way i don't know if this makes, makes much sense but uh for example this is the you know the, the creature sort of started to grow right so this was part of the uh the roof structure now when assembling it uh we you know you, have, you also have to be a bit you know it forces you to be a bit you know to come up with clever sort of Solution. So, far, how, how would you assemble this thing? Well, why not just take the roof structure, put it on the floor, and then put the legs, as you can see here, the legs would stick out, and then we would turn that around. We would turn it around, and oh, okay, we would turn it around, and actually, um, we had three legs, right? This was a structure with three legs, and each leg had a, a way of touching the ground in a different way. So again, using the model or the actual building as a sort of laboratory of ideas, just as we saw in the in the first few projects that we've seen in this presentation. So for example, using what we found, like for example, a sack of a sack of flour or a sack of yeah, sand, or to show that the that the structure was actually strong enough just to place itself lightly on the ground we would just place a few bricks nothing else or for example this was like the more complex thing which was we found uh like an empty gallon of water you say okay use that and we'll just uh you know uh make like a like a little bench so you can attach it to the structure this was sort of like improvised it was also improvised you know i think it's also good that you have an idea from there to the actual end result you know you just have to Get carried away, you know. You have to allow the, the design to sort of speak for itself. I don't know. And okay, this was done with. I think this whole this whole thing. You'll see the end result now, but it was made for like less than twenty euros. At most, it was twenty euros, which is which now is like twenty dollars, right? So you can sort of um, see how how much it actually costs. Very cheap. These are just barbecue sticks. Which is, you know, I think we've all used uh, this kind of uh, material for for some models or something. And the glue gun, the glue gun. Uh, I think I, I I like it too much, but um, yeah, very useful for uh, for um, the nuts because it actually allows a little bit of flexibility. So it allows for the for like the shocks, so it can it can be sort of slightly flexible. So it's therefore structurally sound. And um, yeah. And then just uh, different ways of figuring out how we then cover it because we don't want it to just be sort of weird, bizarre structure. You know, actually, it has to be like a shelter of some sort. So uh, we decided to cover it with two layers of cloth and plastic, so like fabric and, and plastic. And um, so we found like this just lying around. Uh, we said, okay, use that. Now, the next picture, yeah, this one. So you can see here the, the relationship between the two layers and um, how it would actually work together. One for, let's say, rain, the plastic, and another one for shading, so it's the, that's the fabric. And uh, this is the end result, which is kind of, okay, I admit, it's kind of ugly, <laughs> or sort of shabby looking, but um, we would then brought it to the venue where we would have this um, gathering of students, and uh, we had to tear it apart. So again, unexpected things, but you just you know go with the flow and just deal with it. You have to deal with it. You have to deal with 
bring this whole structure, this whole monster of a building, sort of, to this other place. So if you have to break it apart, break it apart, and then you just reassemble it there. So this was in the actual uh, day that we had to exhibit all our um, student projects. Again, this is not, this was not for like design studio. This was like for like a voluntary thing. If you wanted to join with your own idea, you could join. So uh, this was in the. I'm sure Maria recognizes this, this space. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so this was in that day itself. My my other teammate, we were two. We were a team of two. Um, take this really took this really um nice pictures, I think. And um, yeah. You could see how, for example, okay, this is a very interesting picture because as you could see, you could see the scale of the whole of the thing, uh, this monstrous thing that we built. So we would be able to house sort of four or five people sitting comfortably underneath it. Now, maybe you recognize here uh, Campo Baeza, which is a very famous Spanish architect, who was one of them, who was one of the people who arranged these. Um, this uh, gathering of student ideas. So it was kind of, uh, I mean, for me, it was personally very exciting because, you know, Campo Baeza, I'm sure you've seen some of his um, works. Uh, they're all very, you know, great, orthogonal, very pristine, very sort of sacred architecture, very white, everything very, and it was sort of fun to, to see him in this, under this bizarre thing that we built that did not have a single angle. So, um, yeah. And then, okay, I'll show you here a little clip of what the, what the, um, there's no, I mean, the sound is not important, but this was just to show you a bit for the, you know, the, the completeness of the, of the monster that we built. So again, when we bring it back to the, to the place we built it, we had to disassemble it again, so it took on another different shape, but another different shape, and that's okay. That's okay, just. You know, it kept uh, it like life of its own, sort of, right? And uh, of course, there were a lot of imperfections and stuff. But you know, we keep in mind we made this for like under twenty euros, okay? Yes, for like maybe seventeen or eighteen dollars. And uh, so, and then okay, the as we have, you know, remember when I when I told you at the beginning of the of this presentation that we would maybe work with a model and then do the drawings. Well, this is sort of like taking it to the to the extreme, which is you make the building and then you make the um, the drawings, the the plans, the actual plans of the building after the building is made, which is sort of like a contradicting thing, right? But in this case, it, which it would be you know more practical for us to actually make the building and then make the the drawings, the the plans for the building. Right? So, uh, yeah, to to actually make the plans for this building, this was a very complex task, but again, it would, would, you know, you have to think about it. And I, I ended up taking a whole, just whole bunch of pictures, putting them together in Photoshop and then just tracing them uh, just on paper. And from that, you, you took the, the actual elevation, the end elevation of the building. Now you might recognize this of the, you might recognize this drawing from the actual, um, on the poster of this, of this presentation of this talk today. And uh, you can see all the measurements, very, I mean, as rigorous as you can be, of course, yeah, when dealing with uh, with very simple tools. Now, it's always, um, it's always good to develop, you know, these sketch in, in these ideas in like in a sketchbook, which I'm sure you all have your own sketchbooks. I just want to show you one last thing that I made. Um, is this the one? Yeah, okay. This was a, a project that I made just in my room a couple of years ago. Which was it just turned my room into like a, a cave. So just with very simple materials, maybe this is like less than five euros, five dollars. So um, again, working with combination computer drawings and computer modeling, and then making that by hand, just to work in a one-to-one -one scale once again. Because I think that's very important to work in the real world and to actually try to try to make real stuff, right? So yeah, I made this sort of. Um, cave like thing in my in my room so yeah a shelter kind of thing. i get really bored in summer so you know I, I do stuff like this anyway so um from this yeah i think that well we sort of took into you know how would this relate to the actual biological world and it's also interesting to, to look at other disciplines like just not just architecture but as we talked about fashion furniture design art painting and also why not biology you know 
I think it's interesting to study biology and um, you know to get ideas from there because the natural world is you know it's, it's all been done there in a in a better way than we've that we've been able to do it right. So yeah, that's um, I think that's the end. I hope you. I think I have spoke like really fast, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed this and thank you so much for having me again. And, um, it's been a real pleasure. So thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Miguel Angel. This has been a an amazing journey through your uh, learning process and then through your working process and experience and changing skills i i i i loved it i mean i i'm really hoping to see someone following your steps here at njit um i'm going to open the um, questions to the room so please if any, any of you wants to come here and uh, and talk to uh, miguel angel and ask him direct questions uh, you're very welcome to do it I, maybe I just spoke really fast because sometimes I get this thing of you know, the brain just works faster. It was fantastic. I mean, hearing you speaking fast uh, was also making us understand your energy and your and your, the passion you put into the work. Of course, uh, the effort that is there, and um, I think it's really, really meaningful for us to see that and, you know, and, and realize that all of us could be doing the same here. So thank you, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, but really, I want to, I want to engage the room. So who, who wants to come here? Maybe instructors? <laughs> yes. Oh, hi, thanks for the presentation. It was amazing. Thank you. Um, I have a question also sometimes students here, I feel uh, this might maybe actually help students. Uh, so you work with trace paper a lot and has there been any times where for a midterm or a finals, you have to translate everything to a, I don't know, like a, not a trace paper, but like a cleaner paper or like for the last presentation, did you ever have any, like, do you have any methods? How to, you know, translate it into a different format? Like, what do you do usually? Like the last 24 hours before the review, uh, I want to hear like your final step. Um, what do you, do you do 24 hours before like, I cry? Well, <laughs> before the reviews, yeah, the finals. Like, do you usually use collage techniques or like what is your like the final step? Yes, um, I think. Um, yeah. Well, as you've said, I mean, collage is a very, I think, important uh, and useful tool, not just to make a, a collage itself, but also to to think as to think everything as a collage, you know, uh, because in the end, when we're doing those big presentation boards, it, it, it's it's a collage, right? So I think it's very um, useful to to think of that in a, and also just take a. I mean, I think it's good to, for example, take your time in um, making good pictures of your model, and not just okay, I'll I'll just take a whatever a normal picture, and then I'll just Photoshop it. No, it, you know, take your time to actually make a. a Maybe go outside and take a, the picture with natural light or something like that, and um, because then you know if you do it for real, it will look real, sort of. And then just work all the all the documentation that you have, work on it as if as if it were a, a collage, you know. I don't know. Also, like a and also to think of it like a like a storyboard, because in the end you're sort of telling a story, right? You're you're telling your you know the 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 story of of your project, right? Of your thought process, and also, I think it's interesting to not just to show the end result, but also the whole process, because you know the end result. We all know what the end result looks like. Okay, we know what um, I don't know what the theater looks like, or what a you know what the bathroom looks like. It, it's not interesting to show this is where you enter, and then this is where you, you know, where you um, go to sleep or whatever. No, it's actually I, I think it's much more interesting to to see to say how. And why you made it also so also on that final presentation to to show the process more than just the end result. I think so. I think that's uh, yeah. You would be able. So to... I'm also I'm also hearing you are also designing your presentation. I guess uh, mm -hmm. right for the reviews. Like maybe uh, you're also using this like mixed 
mixed mediums, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some trace papers, maybe a video, maybe, I don't know, uh, a model, but like, I think it's like a, all of them together, they make a story like your yes. um, project. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? I don't know. I, I can maybe insist on these questions that uh, Denise are, uh, is asking you. So, for example, when you have a very big drawing that is like uh, six foot large and it's handmade, what do you do with it? Do you, do you take pictures of it to then be able to print it in a like, oh. thick paper or, or do you scan it or what is the technique for well, keeping that drawing alive? Yeah, we actually have, I mean, for just like, for example, for the, for the first few project that I showed, it was just, you know, very, um, like pictures with, you know, not very good quality, but they're actually in our school. I mean, I'm sure you, you know this Maria that we have, uh, like these big scanners that you can just sort of, it's like a roll. You just put the, the paper in and it sort of scans itself like, a like as if, as if it were printing itself. And, uh, so yeah, that becomes like the digital copy. And yeah, I usually use that scanner, which, um, but they have to go, you know, to our school to, to do it. So I can't really do it. That's okay. I admit that it's a lot more uh, practical to sometimes draw by computer because it's already digital and you can just keep it that way. But, um, well, you know, for other stuff, it, you know, it all has pros and cons, right? Uh, both computer mm -hmm. and hand. So yeah, when you. Yeah, when you when you draw it well, by hand, you have to sort of. There are these um, old-fashioned uh, photo, huge photocopies for plans that I'm pretty sure that we can still find where you insert the drawing, and when you yes. get, it's not only a photocopy paper but a PDF. You know, it's the same. You know, it's a huge scanner at the I'm end sure of the day. Sure, in some dusty corner yeah. of the, your university, you have you have it. You know, just waiting for it to be used. Yes. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any, anybody else in the room? You're uh, coming. Okay. So if any other student wants to make a question, please come here and, and you will be able to see Miguel Angel. Hello, and thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is you had, you took sections and then from the sections you traced over and you create axonometrics. How did you do that? Did you just specify a certain angle and just maybe with a T square or not? Did you um, extrapolate that drawing out? Yeah. Just from one of your projects in school. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what I what I did. I mean it, you first of all, I mean you would maybe start with the with a floor plan. And with a floor plan, put another pacing on uh, another paper on top of that. And you just with the T square you sort of extrude the floor plan. So that becomes, uh, you know, with a set angle and that becomes the axonometric drawing. And then you sort of decide, okay, what, what do I want to, you know, actually draw or keep from the floor plan? Because, you know, in axonometric, it's actually a 3D representation, right? So you, so you have to sort of decide. It's actually, um, it's good when you draw by hand that you have to do a lot of thinking of what do I want to show and what do I not want to show? So, yeah, that's basically how I, I work from the floor plan, you make an extrusion with a set angle with the, with the T square and you sort of decide or edit what you want to show or not. And then also it, it, it actually the axonometric drawings, it's good to make them in two layers. So first of all, in a very sort of quick sort of tracing layer, you know, you trace the, the floor plan, you extrude it. And then on another layer on top of that, you sort of make the more, the more clean cut drawing, you know? Okay. So, but it's good uh, to have like the, the all, all of those layers all together just to show the, the process, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I guess that those are the puppet string, um, the puppet strings you were talking before. Yes, as yes you, you have that underlying thread, or um, um, that the drawing is, you know, the thread uh, around. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Um, come on, guys. Like this is your opportunity. I think this is very interesting, and in, to have like this very first-hand demonstration of how to arrive to amazing drawings. Would you like to make a question? This is a new structure. 
Nope. Hey, Miguel Angel, how are you? Um, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. Uh, you have uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful um, um, process uh, in creating all all this uh, work. I was interested, and in, because of the nature of uh, this school, if you could uh, also talk about uh, how other um, disciplines uh, in our um, um, studies affect or not uh, your design. I'm particularly thinking structural design and uh, building systems, um, sustainability, etc. Uh, so they can understand yeah. that. Yeah. Hopefully, all these things have uh, also some um, some room to play in, in your process of designing. Yeah. Okay. Building systems. That was the word I was looking for the whole presentation. Yes. Building systems. Yes. I mean, it's all, I think, something that I don't know about in your school, but in our school in Madrid, uh, they've always taught us to, thought, to think about the architecture in the completeness of the whole thing. So, not just the, not just the, the design, but also... At the same time, thinking about the structure, thinking about how it's built, thinking about how it's built in a, you know, thinking about the environment. So it's all sort of connected. It's not, it's not about, okay, I'll, I want to do this shape. How do I build it? No, it's more like, you know, you, you maybe start off with a, with a particular building system and how do you, how can you use that building system for the, for your project, you know, and not the other way around. So I think it's, uh, it's useful to just think, keep thinking of the whole of all these areas of all these disciplines at the same time and one way of doing this i think I, I showed it in the in the construction project that i that i showed that i would skip through different scales and when you think of different scales you think of you know each scale sort of talks about you know if you use the 125th scale you're obviously talking about building systems or smaller scales than that but if you're talking about you know if you right after that you make a one one hundred scale drawing. You're talking about the architecture or the the design, right? And then if you if you maybe jump to another scale, one one fiftieth scale, you have to talk about structural stuff. So I think um, using different scales is uh, very useful to think all of these disciplines. Like each discipline or each area has its own scale, and drawing with different scales is something that you can really do uh, when you draw by hand. Because when you draw by computer, it's just in like in this very abstract computer space. So you, you know, you get like, you, it's not the same. I don't know if that answers your question. Or... Yeah, you did. No, thank you. Okay. Um, any last question for the, from the room? Are we okay? Yes. Okay. We have one, one student coming up. Okay. How you doing? Hello. Uh, I guess, I guess I just have this question. Like I'm always thinking about this in all my studio classes and I'm always wondering why there's such a big emphasis on abstraction instead of practicality in the beginning of your education as an architect and why that actually isn't reversed. Cause like, Basically, I feel like in the beginning, you would think that things would be more practical. And then as you get more experience, they become more abstract. But pretty much everything I've seen since I've been here is like the complete opposite. So I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. And now that you've kind of gone back to school and you're like a, a teacher now as well, what do you think about that? Well, um, okay, the first thing that comes to mind is <laughs> Maybe for many of us, the only opportunity we'll have to do with this crazy project is in university. But you know that aside, uh, which might be the reality, but uh, but it's kind of depressing to think of that that we won't be able to do these crazy projects outside of school. But um, you know that aside, I think it's um, you know if you think first of the more sort of if you go straight into the like the more abstract crazy way of thinking, which is very you know has a lot of complexity and everything. You will eventually be able to design the simpler stuff, but maybe I understand that. Okay. Like I have never been taught how to design a bathroom. I've actually I have no idea. Not that I have no idea, but it, but I don't think that's the point because actually you'll eventually learn that in a, you know, just looking at the bathroom or, or, you know, you have to, it's, I don't know. It's, I, I think it's a very, 
the simple stuff you sort of learn them in a in a not so direct way like you, you eventually uh subconsciously learn them i don't know if i'm making much sense here but i i think uh you actually do learn this you know um simpler things on the way of thinking of this this sort of more abstract crazy stuff but i, I mean i do i do understand that i i i, I understand you because uh, I do feel that sometimes architecture schools in general do emphasize a bit too much on the crazy, on the bizarre, and it's, you know, then they look at us like as if we were sort of, you know, the people outside of architecture school, they look at us like, you know, like freaks, like, you know, like, okay, but actually, this is, is this actually practical? Now, it's also, and I'll, I'll finish with this, um, I think it's very interesting that, for example, Gaudi, Antonio Gaudí, the Spanish architect that I'm sure you've, yeah, you, you know about. I mean, he his stuff looks really bizarre and really crazy, but it's actually very very practical. And I think I think that's one of the beautiful things about Gaudí is that his stuff is extremely bizarre and very sort of artistic thing, but it's actually very very practical stuff. And uh, yeah, I think that's what made him a genius. Not just because he made these funny shapes, but because it's actually very, very structurally the building systems, everything that he made is very practical, extremely practical. Yeah, because when you get a job, they're like, do you know how to do a bathroom? And then you're like, no. And they're like, I don't know what to use you for. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. I right, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Well, maybe I do have um, a few comments on that. Um... How many, um, and this is the question to the room, how many types of bathrooms do you think there are in the world? Give me, give me a number. What? Millions, right? So when, if, if we are to teach how to do a bathroom, how would you, how would we do it? You know, we start with one and then we do two, three, four, six. And then the exercise for the semester is please give me 1 million bathrooms or something like that. Or, uh, we, we say, okay, this is the human body. Uh, we know how much it, it, um, it weights. We know how big it is. We know how we move when we are sitting and we actually sit when we <laughs> when we use the bathroom, but we also know how tall we are when we rise our hand and we're, you know, with the water is coming from above, what do you need and and where's the light entering from and what kind of ventilation that the space have is it enclosed and dark or is it like very very light and translucent so where, where are the issues of privacy and how do i move around that space and you know what i'm what i'm saying i'm i'm doing a bathroom however i'm not uh starting with the dimensions of the basin but guess what? I know the dimensions of the basings and you should know them as well. So maybe, I don't know if uh, Miguel Angel will agree with me or not. Um, I keep encouraging you to think that architecture school and architecture uh, profession are not that far apart. They are actually the exact same thing. The exact same thing. It, it's your brain the one that is going to do both, you know, the linkage, the link between both worlds is you. And it's on you to decide how much um, you want to be dreamy or, or a poet or a spatial thinker, or you want to do or you want to do just what the manual uh, says. So it's a, it's a personal choice, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. Like for example, uh, this this project, this professor that they had in my first year, Ulargi, uh, you know, he he never said make a kitchen. He would say make a space to prepare food, which is sort of like the same thing, but it's not because when you think about a kitchen, you think of the typical IKEA kitchen, right? From you know standard counters and everything. But when you say okay, it's a space to prepare food, it sort of frees you in a way to make it different, right? Or uh, a you know a uh, uh, a bedroom, he would never say make a bedroom. He would say a place to sleep, which sort of gives you another, you know, it's a different way of looking at it, I think. Right? 
Okay. Well, thank you so very much, Miguel Angel. I think this is the opportunity for the room to give you a big applause. And we are uh, really looking forward to see um, the work the students are going to produce. Yes. And, and hopefully you will be able to join us in a hybrid review or something sure. uh, sometime later on in the semester. My pleasure. So yes. thank you so very much. Thank and you. I know it's getting late for you, but uh, thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You'll, thank you. you'll be in our minds. Thank okay. you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Bye-bye.